All right, I'm going to open this up in a word of prayer, so bow your heads. Uh, Lord, just thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you for allowing us to wake up in our yesterdays and our tomorrows. I just pray that you continue to watch over us in this university, those being inducted today, all these teams and all these work we've put in. I pray that you continue to watch over us and allow us to get our results that we have worked for. And Lord, I just pray that you bless this food for the nourishment of our body and the hands you prepared it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, let's get started. Good morning. Well, I'm the same old uh, $49 guy that wears a $1,000 sport coat. And uh, I want to remind you that as I'm out mingling with you, do not touch it. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's probably better that you don't. It was a story from last year. Well, I got a new story this year. Monday morning at 6 a.m., I'm going to hop on a plane and go to uh, Lewis and Clark College in Lewiston, Idaho. Uh, they have a lecture series there, like very much like we have here, the uh, one that we've had just last night, night before, uh, the Hayes Lecture. But I'm, uh, I'm the featured speaker uh, at the Bob Fredericks Leadership uh, in uh, Lewiston, Idaho. Really looking forward to it. Well, you're going to be my guinea pig. I'm going to give you my, a little bit of my lead-in uh, story. So if it goes over okay, then I'll use it. If it doesn't, well, I, mean, I can scrap it on the way to on the, getting on that plane. So many of you know that I, I broke my leg this summer. I spent uh, most of the summer in a wheelchair and a walker. Not a good summer. I had to cancel a trip to Europe to do a basketball camp. and Just a bummer all the way around. Well, you got to know how it happened. Now, don't ask me how I flipped and twisted and turned and... and uh, when it broke, it sounded like a shotgun. So I knew it was broke. I didn't take a brain surgeon. I'm laying there on my back in, the, in my yard, well up in my yard, and uh, get up on my elbows where I could see, and uh, hmm, I'll be darned. My uh, major part of my leg was east and west, but the lower part of my leg was north and south, and uh, I knew it wasn't a good deal. I got to get down to the street where somebody can see me because I'm going to need some help. So I uh, got up on my elbows and I shinnied down through my yard. And every time I'd shinny a little bit, it would, you know, I could feel those bones. How's that for your breakfast, huh? Uh, it was not a good deal. I get down to the, uh, the street. Well, I planned on stopping before I got in the street. Well, I wound up in the street. I'm in the gutter. Well, that wouldn't have been a big deal, except it had been raining, really, like, really a lot. And where I live, there's about four blocks worth of water. It comes down the hill, turns the corner, and it's a river. So I'm laying there in the gutter, in the water, and all of a sudden the water's coming over the top of me. Man, it was so cold, and I remember sticking my neck up so I won't drown. I'm looking up in the sky, and I was thinking, gosh, I hope I don't drown. And bingo, here comes a lady in a van. It's like God answered my prayers. I'm going to get some help. She slows down. She's very close to me. She looks at me, and she keeps moving. She keeps looking. She keeps moving, she keeps looking, and I'm looking at her. We see each other for sure, and then she drives off. <laughs> True story. True story. Well, how I'm going to work that into Lewis and Clark College is, why would you have a guy come 
over a thousand miles to give a speech when he has absolutely no credibility in his own hometown. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they'll relate to that or not. I'm going to try to make them think I'm an ordinary guy, but I'm going to wear this $1,000 uh, sport coat, and they'll think I'm a big hip hypocrite. And then I'm going to say, hey, it's at noon. It's a noon lecture. Half the people have already eaten, and it's nap time. The other half are thinking about food. And I'm going to say, hey, I'm here to talk. You're here to listen. And let's do the best we can to finish at the same time. Now, if they, if they get that joke, I, I'm home free. If they don't get it, just like you didn't, uh, I think I'm in big, big time trouble. You know. Very good. Thank you, Coach. Uh, good morning to everyone. And on behalf of the athletics department and student athletes and coaches, uh, a sincere welcome. It is really special to get our, our former players and, and uh, people that have made a, a big difference at, uh, at ESU, uh, none of which, though, uh, Coach Ron Slaymaker has meant so much to us. So, Coach, first of all, let me, let me thank you for all of the stuff you've done and continue to do for ESU. <laughs> Our athletics department is strong. Uh, I'm really proud of the coaches and the student athletes that we have. Um, you know, there's a standard to reach uh, that you all, uh, the inductees, uh, and those that have played a big part in, in ESU athletic history, you've set the bar really high. And, uh, uh, but I'm confident that our student athletes and coaches are, are up to that challenge and we'll, we'll keep moving ahead and, and uh, make you as proud of your athletics department as, as we are of you. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Kent. Um, <clears throat> all right, um, President, uh, would you come on, just mosey on up here. Uh, President Garrett, uh, she's no rookie anymore, been here a long time, things have happened, she's, she's a mover and a shaker, and a really, I shouldn't say this, but I will. I may have said it before. She's an athletic supporter. <laughs> Sorry. This is when I take the mic. <laughs> anyway, I don't know how you do it, President. You're you're at everything. <laughs> Thank you. How do you do that? Just clone myself. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. I want to say thank you and welcome to all of you for coming this morning. Uh, I want to take just a minute and recognize Christy Beyer. Christy, where are you? Right here, the number two in our athletics department and a phenomenal leader. She has done an amazing job here in the last couple of years. And I want to say thank you to all of you, whether you're a current athlete or a former athlete or just a friend to Emporia State Athletics. Uh, we are so fortunate to have all of you as ambassadors for this university Lots of great things are happening. Uh, Ron mentioned some of the construction that's been going on. Just a couple of other quick things I want to share with you. For the last three years, our career placement rate has been 97% on the average, uh, which I think is the highest in the system. Our students have had the lowest average debt for graduates in the, in the Kansas public educational system for the last four years at least. And our student athletes, are doing a phenomenal job, not just on the court, on the field, on the track, but also just in life as community servants and great students, and we are so proud of everything that's going on in the athletic department here at Emporia State. Welcome, and I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, President. And uh, President Gates' husband, Chip, over here on the side. Glad to have you here as always. Christy, you're the one I forgot. You're special, did I say? Yes, I said you're special. Okay, she has a big job, big job. Um, Kent and President, uh, okay, all right. Kent, uh, are you ready on your end? Okay. 
way we're going to do this, uh, honorees, uh, you will come up here. And you want them on the stage or over here? Are you going to? Okay, we'll come up on the stage. And uh, I'll read your little bio. And then as you are up here, you and I will sit down in these nice comfy chairs. And I think ESPN truck is outside ready to film this. Uh, we'll have a little interview. It'll be short. But uh, we started this, uh, this is the third year we've done it this way. Works out OK. Uh, we can control the time a little bit. And fortunately or unfortunately, we've got to keep things moving because there's so many things going on. Uh, so that will be, uh, you'll be up here, you'll get your award, you'll sit down, I'll, we'll visit a little bit, and then you sit back out here, and the next one we'll go with, okay? <clears throat> uh, if we could have, first of all, uh, Bree, Beatty, Eddie, please come up. Bree Beatty Edier, softball, 2002-2006. Beatty was an All-American shortstop for the Hornets' national runner-up team. She set at Emporia State single-season records with 87 hits, 74 runs scored, as she led the Hornets to the 2006 NCAA Division II National Championship game. She hit 410. 420, uh, and her 74 runs set the MIAA single season record as she was named the most valuable player in MIAA in 2006. Bree Beatty Edier. Well, are you nervous? Not at all. The camera's on? Okay. <laughs> uh, Bree uh, takes a lot more than uh, good players to have a good team. Uh, and I think as you and I have talked, uh, you felt that your group of girls that you played with was special. Would you like to rate, relate that to us? Yeah, I mean, our team, obviously, we had the talent, but as a coach now, I realize that how special that team was. Um, we just had, like, an all-in mindset, that um, never-give-up mindset. Everyone, I think, on our team knew their role, rather they were, if they were in the starting lineup or, um, you know, on the bench, everyone had a role and realized that it was going to take the entire team to be successful. And... Um, we had a lot of wins that year, so that type of mentality really, um, it pays off. And I don't think until you've experienced that as a player, um, it's, it's very hard to realize that. And since I experienced it as a player, I now get to coach it with my team. So. And you came through the loser's bracket at we the did, national yes. tournament, we, which is um, difficult. Yes. Uh, we won our first game. Um, and then we did lose that next game, so then we had to work our way through the loser's bracket when we made it to the national championship game. And um, unfortunately, we lost that game, but we would have had to beat them twice to win it all. Yeah. You're now a coach at Olathe North. You've been to the state tournament three times in a short career so far. What have you taken from your time here that you've transferred to your time at Olathe North? I mean, I just, I see myself when I'm coaching, just thinking of all the experiences that I had as a player. And, um, you know, like I said, just teaching the girls, it's, it's more about the game. It's more about themselves. Um, and it, that's a very hard concept to teach high school students, um, you know, to not worry about stats and um, errors and teaching them how to deal with failure. Um, you know, because obviously I didn't have this type of career every year that I was at Emporia, so there was a lot of failure that I dealt with, and um, I feel like just kind of getting that philosophy through to my team has been um, something that I try to do every year, and um, to allow the girls to fail forward 
in all of that they do is kind of the philosophy that we have. You have any drama? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I coach girls, <laughs> so. But, I do too, that's why I asked. <laughs> I know, right? Um, actually, I've, I, I kind of open up when I'm coaching and I say I don't like drama, I don't deal with drama, and I don't think there's any cheerleaders out here. I said, I'm not coaching cheerleading. Like, this is, <laughs> this is, you know, I, so I'm very upfront with them about that. And I always tell them, which I was told as a player, you know, you don't have to be everyone's best friend, but you will be respectful and treat everyone with respect because they're your teammates. So I kind of set that expectation at the beginning, and it seems to have worked. I've been, I mean, this is only my fifth year as head coach, but I've been coaching for about 10 years now. So, um, I, and I always say every year, I, I, have, I have two children, and my life's gotten really busy. My husband's um, pursuing a professional golf career, so I say every year, I'm like, oh, this might be my last year, but the, the, my girls are what keep me coming back because I have the best girls. So. Well, most of my friends said, uh, are you crazy when I said I was going to coach high school girls? There'll be drama. So that's why I ask, okay? <laughs> All right, thank you, Bree. Appreciate it. Steve Bushnell. Steve's not going to touch my coat. Steve Bussnell, baseball, 1989-90. Uh, Bussnell was a two-year letter winner on the middle infield for the Hornets and has gone on to have a tremendous career as a high school baseball coach. He has been the head baseball coach at Seaman High School since 1999, has won nine Kansas State 5A state championships with a 401-103 record in 21 years. He was the American Baseball Coaches Association High School Division III National Coach of the Year in 2018 and is a, Banner, uh, a Ban Johnson League Hall of Famer. Steve Bushnell. Steve, you spent uh, two years here. Uh, what could you tell us that you took from those two years uh, into the rest of your life? It was really the, uh, it was kind of the springboard of, of a lot of the success that I've had um, since I graduated from ESU in, in the spring of 1991. I was here for actually three years. I played my junior and senior year uh, for Coach Emberry in uh, 89 and 90. Um, so to look back over the last 30 years and and to see uh, you know how much it has evolved and, and how many great things have have come from this university and and um, and all the great people um, that are here today, uh, the former alumni, Coach Bingham, um, you know, my former teammate of mine, Coach Fernelli, uh, now Coach Wheeler, uh, just just the people you meet um, through the university and through the community. Uh, have, uh, have always impacted my life. So it was just a very special time uh, on those three years that I was here in Emporia. Steve, there's a lot of uh, people out here that are coaches. Um, you know, most of us never get to a state tournament, let alone win it. And you've done it nine times. That's ridiculous. To me, yeah. I call that, as a coach myself, uh, you've got a program. you got more than a good team year after year, but you've got a program that sustains itself year after year. Give us a little insight into you know, what your program is about, how you've developed that, uh, how it year after year. Don't want to put the hex on you for this year. Going to be good? 
I think we got a chance to be really good. <laughs> All right. Uh, tell us about the program. Uh, it's just been, uh, it's, I mean, if I could bottle it and, uh, and sell it, and if I knew exactly, you know, what it was that, that was the key for our success, uh, you know, I, I guess I could make a lot of money. But uh, I would say it just comes back to your core values, your traits, the things that you grew up uh, believing in. Um, just as a as a person, um, the success that we've had at, at Seaman, it, it truly is mind-boggling for for me to be there 21 years and and to play in 13 state championship games and and to win nine of those in in 21 years is is truly remarkable. And it's definitely not about me, as I would say, you know, our teams here at Emporia State and, and what I learned as a as a young player and as a coach. And, and those values that I believe make you successful, that's what you try to get across to your team. Much as Bree said with, with her girls at Olathe North, you just try to give back to the game that's given you so much. And um, just our administration at, at Seaman in, in North Topeka, um, you know, I've got a principal and an athletic director that are here uh, this morning with us. I've got a couple of assistant coaches, Coach Simino and, and Coach Oliva. Uh, that have been a part of that program and just had just obviously wonderful talent, wonderful players, and a great parent support group that's uh, that's really a collection of all those different parts that 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 uh, that make for a quality program, as you mentioned. And and I'm just fortunate enough to uh, to get to be the leader of that group and and wear the hat and and get the recognition that that um, that we receive when when the teams do well. But it's just a collection of a lot of things, and I think it it's uh, it's very similar to what we have here at Emporia State University. I didn't know exactly how you'd answer that, but it uh, didn't surprise me that you included everybody, and it obviously a good program will include everyone. Thanks, Steve. You're welcome. Connor Comras. Connor Crumbless, baseball, 2006, 2009. Crumbless was the MIAA Player of the Year as he led the Hornets to a national championship runner-up finish in 2009. A three-time All-MIAA pick with two first-team selections, he graduated as the MIAA record holder with 78 career doubles. He set Emporia State career records with 272 runs, 311 hits, 842 at-bats, and the single season record for 30 doubles. He was drafted in 2009 by the Oakland A's and advanced to AAA in 2013 with that organization. Connor Crumbless. Connor, you've uh, been a four-year guy. You won a lot of games, and part of winning a lot of games, you had a lot of honors. Uh, what What have you taken uh, from that four-year stint into your real life as it is now? Uh, I mean, I guess from my four years here, the, the things I'm a lot really proud of. Um, you know, we were, we had four. Really good teams, uh, maybe not the most talented teams in the league, uh, but we certainly worked hard. Uh, that never give up attitude that we, we heard earlier, and um, you know I think you can carry that anywhere. Just just keep at, keep plugging away, and uh, just really proud of that that kind of stuff. What do you do now? So I'm in optometry school. I've got a year and a half left. Uh, I went back to school after my playing career, and uh, uh, we live in Chicago. My wife and, and two kids. That's, that's good. Uh, obviously, uh, with that ahead of you, that 
an athletic career or a college career has had a lot to do with what you're doing right now? Certainly. Uh, I mean, I certainly learned how to work hard. Um, it's a little bit different kind of work hard. I mean, you got to use your mind instead of your body, but um, uh, just, I just keep plugging away and, and try to finish it. So, what uh, Your time at Emporia State, uh, what did that have to do with your uh, propelling yourself into professional baseball? Which you obviously were successful at that. You get to triple A. That's pretty good. Not where you probably wanted to be, but pretty darn good. Yeah, I mean, I, I have no complaints about the, the career I was able to have. Uh, I had a lot of fun, obviously, at Emporia State and then in the years after that. Um, uh, I feel like I gave it everything I had. I don't have any regrets. Uh, I would just, if I could do it over again, I definitely would. So it was fun. Okay. Thanks, Connor. Yep. Our next inductee was Landis Franklin, who was unable to be here. I think his wife has had some health problems, and uh, we'll induct uh, Landis whenever it is convenient for him to be back here, whether it be in the spring or whatever it may be, we'll take care of that at another time. Uh, speaking for Marshall Havenhill, Doc, Doc Havenhill, Hill will be his wife, Anne. Ann and I decided yesterday that uh, maybe we would just stand down there, but it's uh, worked out that she's right up here with everyone else. She and I both have a hard time with stairs and, and easy chairs. Marshall Havenhill, team physician, 1983 to 2017. Havenhill was a longtime team physician that passed away in 2017 after serving Emporia State student athletes for 14 years or for 34 years. He had been a member of the Kansas State Board of Healing Arts, Athletic Training and Advisory Council, received the Athletic Club Service Award in '97, and the Emporia State University Service Citation in 2007. Dr. Marshall Havenhill. <clears throat> and I think uh, you may want to introduce uh, Dr. Havenhill's children. I have two daughters here yep. today, uh, Amy. Schulte lives in Overland Park, and Annette Dix lives in Manhattan. And our son Asher didn't come in for breakfast from Tucson, so yeah. thank okay. you. Uh, I, like some others, I think I knew Dr. Havenhill pretty well, because when you guys first came here, yes. uh, Doc was my wife's physician when he was in private practice. And then uh, when he got into working at the university, uh, he was, uh, wow, he could talk about anything. And every class I ever taught, uh, he was for sure one of my highlights <laughs> for that semester. He even did I, some help in the English department. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the only class he never taught, or, or at least talked to, that I taught was my fishing class. I don't think he ever uh, helped with that. Fisherman, no. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Doc was an unusual guy. If we, if we had 100 topics to discuss, he could talk about every one of them with some authority, with some interest, with some knowledge. Uh, he was just one of those kind of guys and uh, very helpful to a lot of athletes here over that 34-year period of time. Tell us about uh, Jack Havenhill, the, the man, the, the things that we don't know about him. Well, he, after we lived in Kansas City nine years when he was in training, then we went into the Army for three years, 
and we were looking for a place to settle down with our family. We had three children by then. He, we decided not to go back to the city because at that point he was an OBGYN and he didn't want to live a long way from the hospital because then he'd had to stay there a lot. And uh, we lived about four blocks from the hospital, so it was really convenient for our family. We chose Emporia because of Emporia State University, and it was a blessing for us because it offered him, he, he loved Sherlock Holmes, especially in the English department. He helped with that. He taught some anatomy when they had an overload of students enrolled and didn't have room. He, the students were his big thing, and he loved dealing with all the athletes. Unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, he didn't get to see all the athletes because if they didn't get sick, they didn't get to see him. But that was okay. <laughs> but he did a lot for, for the athletic department, enjoyed the coaches, the staff, and all the students in particular. Um, he does have had a good relationship, I think, with all the coaches. They trusted him in, in what his decisions were. And I know he had a, a he told me about something that he had with you that I will share because you don't know this. Okay. <laughs> we Maybe. were sharing a lot today. This is a short one. But one time he took care of the uh, visiting teams. The, the physician here took care of the visiting team's players. And one of the star players on the opponent's team had a big cut on his face or head. or I don't even remember where. And so he took him back, sewed him up, and sent him back into the game. And you scolded him because he sent him back too soon. He worked too fast. <laughs> uh, that's, that was clever. I'm not sure that's true. Oh, oh, were you, yeah, it was. Well, I don't think you really scolded him, but you said, why did you send him, let him come play so fast? You should have slowed down. <laughs> so, that's, that's the honest truth. I remember. <laughs> But he did enjoy the athletes, and one thing that wasn't mentioned in his bios was his teaching. And he taught, he taught athletic trainers to be the very best that come out of a program in the state of Kansas. And he kind of designed a program in, with Matt Howe and some of the other athletic trainers. He worked with Doc Baxter for a long time. But they set up a program, Medical Issues in Athletic Training, and this covered the current things like heat, stroke, and uh, just other things that were going on and and he taught those trainers to recognize those things and his philosophy was if you ask enough questions and the right questions they'll tell you what's the matter with them and thank you very much You're welcome. We appreciate it. I wish I wish I wish Jack was here I wish Jack was here instead of me this is a special time obviously for me. Thank yes you. thank you Natalie Villefleur Modine, women's tennis and volleyball, 2004, 2008. Natalie was a seven time all MIAA selection with two um, first team and two second team selections in uh, singles alone and then uh, first team picks in doubles and, uh, and won second team honors in doubles. She led Emporia State to their first MIAA team championship in a trip to the NCAA Sweet 16 in 2007. She was the school record holder with a 59 and 7 singles record in dual play and went 60 and 16 in doubles. She was a three time ITA Central Region champion in doubles with two different partners and was in the academic all district. Uh, per, was a all-district performer. She also played volleyball for the Hornets as a freshman and sophomore. 
Natalie Villaflor Modine. Natalie, again, you have a four-year career, so a lot of things happened over that time. Yes. Uh, a lot of wins, obviously. Uh, very impressive. Um, Thank you. Tell us what it was like to win the league, which hadn't happened that often, and then to go to the national tournament. What were those feelings like as you progressed through that last season? Well, we... That season, I remember we had a couple hard losses, and I specifically remember it coming down to my match um, in the season, and I actually lost both of those, um, which was really hard. But then when we played again at the end of the year, uh, make no mistake, I, I made up for it. <laughs> so I think we, we overcame a lot uh, individually and as a team. And we were so excited um, not only to do this, to do that for the first time, I believe, in women's tennis history here at Emporia State, but we were really excited about uh, Disney World <laughs> and going to Disney World. We didn't actually get to go, but um, it was nice to play in warm weather and not freezing cold. <laughs> we were really excited about that. So. Great. Um, what was your... Uh early inspiration uh, to play tennis and uh, who taught you the game? So my dad, Coach Dick Villaflor, he, um, he played college tennis and uh, he just taught me and was my coach and my mentor growing up and um, he took me, him and my mom took me to all the tournaments and um, it's really a blessing that I get to say I had the best coach um, because I did. He's has more, way more honors than I do. So um, he's one of the best tennis coaches in the state of Oklahoma and the country. So it's really a blessing. <laughs> and he is here today. Yes, he's right there. Okay, Dad. <laughs> okay. Uh, great career, Natalie. Thank you very much. Thank you. If we could have all the 1985-86 uh, basketball team, that's the team being honored this year. If you could guys could just come up front here, over on the side here, and the coaches. The 1986 men's basketball team. The 1985-86 Hornets won a school record 31 games en route to a round of 16 appearances in the NAIA tournament in Kansas City, led by five starters that all graduated from high school within two hours' drive of Emporia. The Hornets were undefeated in White Auditorium, picking up a win over two-time national champion Fort Hayes in the District 10 championship game to go to Kansas City. They defeated BYU Hawaii, Hawaii in the first round after falling to eventual national champion David Lipscomb, 79-76 in Kemper Arena. Brian Robinson and Craig Strongren both earned All-American honors. 1986 men's basketball team. Craig uh, Strongrum is going to uh, speak for these guys after, uh, after I speak. <laughs> I was never in charge of this team, but I am now, okay? Uh, that's the only thing I take credit for with the football team, with the fact that I just stayed out of the road. And uh, what a great bunch of people. You know, all coaches, all, all your teams are special. And... Uh, some just win more games than others, and it just seems more special, but this was a great uh, group of guys uh, and coaches. Uh, really was about three years in the making. There's some things that you may not know about. Uh, 
several of these guys uh, played and started as sophomores. And uh, that year we beat the national championship team, Fort Hayes, at Fort Hayes uh, on a last second shot by Sam Miller. And they go ahead and win the national championship that year, easily in fact, but uh, we were the champion that night at, uh, at Fort Hayes. The next year, uh, we won 24 games. We had a few additions to that, but it was also a good team and uh, lacked one point of beating a Division I team. Uh, funny bounce of the ball, and that's the way basketball is. That's what makes it a, a great game. Um, and as seniors, there was little question that this was going to be a really special team. And, and the guys that didn't play a lot on this team uh, went on to have good teams of their own in, in the, the years to follow. Because we really only played seven guys a lot. And uh, I, I don't know if I could even say uh, six and seven. It was just seven guys that played most of the, of the time. And uh, those guys that did come off the bench were little short guards, uh, John Kramer and, and <laughs> Bob Yonke. Uh, but we knew early that this was going to be a, a special team. We uh, go to Hutch Juco for a clinic uh, before the season started, and we're going to have a scrimmage, a big clinic. A, a lot of coaches throughout the state were there. And uh, Bob Yonke overheard one of the Hutch players calling us small time. Oh, we're playing small time. Well, we had a little balloon that we took around with us through the season that had a little mouse pulling an elephant. And uh, it, it kind of was our uh, battle cry, so to speak. Well, that day, we weren't supposed to keep score of that game. But uh, all of a sudden, we were keeping score. And uh, I called a timeout. <laughs> I said, OK, all bets off. Uh, I think we won that game by 32, embarrassed uh, Hutch Juco. Hutch Juco went on to be a runner-up national champions that year, and we just toyed with them. So there was a little question early in the year that uh, we were going to be pretty good. Uh, we weren't perfect. We went to Fort Hayes that year, uh, late season. Uh, Again, minimal things I ever took any credit for, but I take credit for this one. We're going to get beat. Late, late game, we're down, I don't know, 15 points. We're not going to win the game. And uh, coaches sometimes can dictate the score. And uh, I just let the score build. They wound up beating us, I think, by 34. Uh, that was this team right here. They beat us by 34. But with the motivation in mind that in a couple of weeks, we're going to play you again, buddy. And we kicked their ass. Yes. And went to Kansas City. A woulda, coulda, shoulda national championship team standing right here. Uh, again, basketball is a crazy game. And we had some crazy things happen uh, that night. Brian Robinson, who uh, will be here a little later, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> That's an inside joke. Uh, Brian, Brian always uh, kind of beat by his own drum, uh, and he is today also. Uh, but his 28 points a game, uh, we, we tolerated his uh, inconsistencies. <laughs> but as you can see, this is it's not a big team, not a big team at all. Uh, we were out-rebounded four times, uh, 36 games, out-rebounded four times. And uh, boy, could they play. Uh, we had some guys that were pretty slow. Uh, I always kidded. Uh, yeah, Jim knows I'm going to talk about him. Uh, he spent the last uh, month of the season with a broken foot, but played. He played. And uh, you could never tell the difference between uh, when he had a broken foot and when he didn't have a broken foot. He was slow. Either way, he was very slow. <laughs> And uh, we had, uh, we really had one guy on the team that was pretty fast. And uh, pick, pick out the fastest guy in this, this team. 
Anybody know who the fastest guy on this team was? Step forward, Marvin. Step forward. That's a fast, that guy can run, I'm telling you. <laughs> and, and John and, and all the guys, they just kept up with Marvin, and, and we were pretty good. All right, I'll shut up because I could tell stories, and then there'll be other stories. Craig, go for it. So anyhow, this is a sleigh pops into my office four weeks ago, five weeks ago, and he is so, so excited. He said, guess what's going to happen? He says the, our 86 team is going to get inducted in the Hall of Honor. And th this is really uh, this is a tribute to you and everybody else here, but uh, Coach Slay taught us more than basketball, and he's taught probably a lot of you more than basketball. He teaches about love. Some of you may understand that. Uh, he's taught us about life, you know, and just how to carry ourselves in, uh, in a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we, we had so much fun. Uh, as a team and all these guys all these coaches it, it's so great to see you know all of you and, and we weren't the biggest team we weren't the most talented team but we were gritty and we went out every night and our goal was to you know we're going to play harder than the next team we're going to box out harder than the next team and we were fortunate we had somebody that can score 28 points a game uh, that helped a lot but uh, you know some of you here were probably here for a lot of those sellouts when White Auditorium was locked. And what I mean by locked is they would not allow anybody else into the auditorium. And 16 and 0 at home, it, it, it felt really, really good. But anyhow, I just want to say thanks to the fans. Thanks to you, Coach Slay. Thanks for all the players, you know, uh, the coaches, Mike LaRose. Mike was with us one year. And he, I was telling him earlier, he, he probably taught us more about grit. You know, he is probably more structured than we were structured, right? <laughs> uh, Scott Brown, and then some of you might recognize the, the tall guy in the blue there, uh, Gary Carrier. So, but all these guys helped us out to achieve what we, we, we achieved. And it was, uh, it's hard to believe it's been 34 years. Uh, it just goes by so fast. And so the last thing I want to say to all the players and the younger people out there, enjoy your time here at Emporia State. Uh, it goes by so fast, it seems like yesterday. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. Now, last year, after we, uh, we had done this for the second time, I had a bunch of 10 people say, hey, we want to know who these people are, because they've changed. Uh, <laughs> Some people have changed. And uh, so real quick, let me uh, tell you who we got. Jason Bogart. Jason lives in California now, works in the movie industry. He's a big cheese. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Spends a lot of time in Europe. Right? Yeah. All right. Larry Burns. Uh, Larry was our student coach that year and has gone on to coach. Now he's retired. Uh, but what a guy. What a guy. Michael Rose was uh, really the first assistant coach I ever had. I had a lot of graduate students who were great. Uh, at 17 years, my first 17 years, all graduate students. And they were good, but Mike was my first full-time assistant, and he made a difference. Made a difference. Lives in Michigan now. Uh, Gary Carrier, uh, we will not uh, hold it against him. He, he did play and graduate because I didn't do a good enough job recruiting. Uh, I told him he could fish out of my place, he could hunt, he could trap. Uh, he could do all the things that he loves to do, but he went to Washburn. But he came, uh, started his master's degree here. Got your master's degree. Kind of. Almost. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> but Gary's been a teacher and, a, and, a, and you coached too, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. And now he's in the logging business and he's a bass fisherman. That sounds tough. <laughs> Dennis Sport, uh, Dennis has gone on, coached ever since he left here, went on uh, with his group of guys, and we had good teams when uh, he was a senior, and uh, Dennis is still coaching Osage City. John Kramer from Wellsville, and, and by the way, on that little bio, uh, number five and six, they were even less than two hours away. Uh, John's from Wellsville, and Bob's from Alma. So the top seven guys were all just a blink away from Emporia, which made it a little unusual. John is a, a county uh, guy and lives in Wichita. Actually, you live in Goddard, don't you? 
Yeah, it's close to Wichita, I think. Okay, Scott Brown was a graduate student at the time. Uh, Scott has gone on. His dad was a coach, so he's he's a coaching tree, I guess. Has gone on to uh, coach many years in Arizona and still coaching. Yeah, still coaching. So. Uh, Scott and I have talked on the phone, and he's got some ideas for me. So if you watch Chase County Girls next year, uh, some uh, Arizona connection might happen. <laughs> John uh, Hughes, uh, he came as a freshman and uh, one of the four-year guys and uh, was just always there. He was always there, and I use you, John, as an example many times. You don't have to be the fastest. You don't have to jump the highest, but you knew how to play. That was the important thing, really knew how to play. Marvin uh, came to us uh, that year, that senior year, was, was from Valley, Valley Center, had been in the Army, had been at Friends before that, and so we inherited Marvin, and uh, Marvin's not tall, but if you look at his legs and his arms, he's tall. He's a lot taller than what he looks. Right, Marv? Yeah. <laughs> and and his uh, February, uh, he, he limped along on the court. I don't know how he even played uh, in February, but uh, uh, toughness was a, a big factor. Jim Biggs, uh, Jim, love Jim, uh, from Waverly, a lawyer. Don't hold that against him now, but uh, if you need a lawyer, he's in Topeka, B-I-G-G-S. Uh, yeah. Waverly, uh, tough, tough, tough was uh, written across his forehead. Uh, the bigger the better. And he liked them, and he'd knock knock their butts off. It didn't didn't matter who it was. And uh, Jim was kind of like John, my two twin towers on the wings. That either one of them could hardly touch the rim, but that was okay. They got a lot of rebounds, a lot of rebounds. <laughs> Bob Yonke uh, from Alma. Uh, Bob was a guy that I. Uh, <laughs> I'm touching his coat. I'm yeah. touching his coat. <laughs> Bob uh, really became a player. He kind of recruited himself here. Uh, he would, had been at Pratt and wanted to come here. That's always a good sign when you wanted to come here. And he wanted to come here, and my God, he made himself a player. And so he was a big part of that team. Uh, Craig Stronger, he's from Abilene, and uh, now lives in, uh, or works in Topeka, lives in Silver Lake. And... Uh, uh, I still remember that championship game against Fort Hayes when he took a, an All-American from Hayes, uh, Raymond Lee, who wasn't very big, but Craig just backed him up, backed him up, backed him up, and it just, I don't know, did you dunk over him? You may have. We'll say you did. You will say you did, yeah. <laughs> Craig was uh, uh, Really, in some ways, I'm not sure he's tall as Marvin, but uh, close. And we always said our tallest guy on this team uh, that, that played a lot was, was Craig. And he's our point guard. You know, it's good to have a tall point guard. And, uh, and he certainly was. And this, this whole team is a whole bunch of good leaders. And boy, another criteria for a good team. Guys, got to shut up because we've got things to do and places to go. Appreciate you. Thank you.